I guess we should go ahead and get started. Okay, thank you everybody for coming in tonight and um, help me welcome Paul Schneer from Sunny Hill Garden in Florence, who's going to tell us about bugs and other pests in your garden. Thank you. If you have questions whenever we get started, just holler at me and we'll try to answer them along the way. What I thought we'd do is uh, start out uh, talking about the insect problems that have shown up at Sunny Hill this spring. And uh, I also want to introduce you to Roxanne Agnes. She's a real entomologist. I had one course in entomology, and I was calculating today that was 51 years ago. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure that the bugs have changed much, but everything else has. <laughs> so anyway, I thought in case I got in trouble, we would refer to Roxanne. Okay. She also put together our PowerPoint, and so uh, I, she's a little bit more technically savvy than I am, and so uh, it turned out to be a really nice PowerPoint. She also brought some of her collection along so that you can see what some of these insects look like in real life. <clears throat> I brought a few pesticides along so that we can talk about those to a certain extent. Okay. So, but again, if you have any questions as we are proceeding, uh, please uh, holler at me. Okay. How do I use it? Just. Right up there. Just click toward the back there and it should advance okay. the slides. Do I lie to you? <laughs> Don't let it bug me. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All right, bagworms. I see it. There's the, I took punched the wrong arrow. Mm -hmm. Okay, bagworms. This is a major problem in our area. Uh, usually the damage starts to show up about right now, okay? And you'll see this bagworm here. This is an adult bagworm, okay? And that is the bag, and as the little boys and little worms, the girl and male and female worms uh, eat, they start to form this shelter around themselves, okay? And you can see them at times, actually, the mouth, the head and the mouth part of the worm is outside of the bag feeding, okay? And then later on in the, in the summer, uh, the um, males come out of their bags and they go find a lady and they mate and she lays her eggs in the bag worm and then she dies, okay? And so they overwinter as eggs, and correct me on this all. And then the next spring, uh, they uh, come out then as worms and they start this whole process over. In our area, I tell people to spray for bagworms on Memorial Day. And the reason why I do that is simply because it's a day I can remember and most people can remember. And generally, the worms, the new worms have come out of the bag and have started to munch. If you put a pesticide on the bag itself, won't do much good because it won't penetrate the bag, okay? When they first start, you, they're going to look like a little cone, about a quarter of an inch long, and you'll have to look for little cones, but you can see them move just a little bit. And as they feed again, they will create this bag around. The bag itself will look like the foliage of the structure that they are munching on, okay? Now, one way to control them is to pull the bags off, okay, and so you get rid of them that way. Uh, the second way is to make a chemical application of some sort of a pesticide. These are bugs, are munchers, and so you use a pesticide that they ingest and that kills them, okay. Each one of these bags on average will generate 750 eggs and so you'll have 750 little bagworms coming out of there next spring to munch on your trees and shrubs. When they get really bad, you can see them hanging from telephone poles, gutters, <coughs> you name it, they hang from them. This is a major problem 
especially with evergreen shrubs, because evergreen cannot um, cannot recuperate. Okay. But you can, like I said, you can find them on anything. Uh, any questions from backworms? How did they get there initially? Initially? Uh, the, uh, you can, at some times, you can see them crawling across the lawn, going to a different uh, shrub. Uh, the female's wingless. Right. Uh, I couldn't, it's very, very hard to get a picture of the, of the female. But the, male, the male is right there in the middle mm -hmm. with the wings, mm -hmm. and I actually have one here that I was able to collect. Sure. And the picture right next to the arborvitae that is half eaten um, is actually a male on the top, and the female is in that back. Okay. okay. And and they'll move. You know, they might get on a puppy dog or something. There's lots of different kinds of ways that they move. Okay. Okay. These are spider mites, and they're not really insects. What do they call the arachnids? Arachnids, okay. See, I did remember something. <laughs> uh, these are not actually insects. Insects have six legs. If you will look there, they have eight legs, okay? A spider mite is generally very small, okay? And it has a mouth part. Instead of being a muncher, it's a mouth part like a hypodermic needle. And it will stick that in foliage and just suck the juices out of whatever uh, it's working on, okay? So quite often when you see a mottled leaf, okay, you have green and a little specks of white, uh, you know, that's a good indication that you might have spider mites on your particular shrub or plant, okay? Now since they are suckers, you have to use a pesticide, not that you would generally use a pesticide that you spray on to cover their body and they, uh, the, the pesticide has to go into them through their body. Okay. They have a soft body, okay? The other thing that you can do is you use a systemic insecticide which moves into the plant and as they suck that out of the plant, uh, they'll pick up some uh, pesticide uh, that particular way. Okay. These can be uh, quite troubling, especially on, on certain uh, vegetable plants. Uh, you find them quite often on things like that. It can be a real major problem on a lot of flowers, uh, those kinds of plants. Okay. But spider mites, uh, and they're hard to control, I'll just be honest with you. They are very difficult. Can you actually see the mite, or do you have to look for other? No, you can signs? see the mite. You can see it. What you do is you take a white piece of paper and you take the foliage and shake it over. And I usually bring a hand lens or, with me, uh, or a mat, what they call a macroscope, which will magnify whatever you're looking at. Uh, sometimes you can see them. Sometimes you can't. You notice quite often they've got a kind of a light green color. Okay, and that's fairly typical of a lot of the spider mites. Okay, you don't you, you it's 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 hard to find a good insectic, uh, insecticide to kill spider mites. Okay, there are other ways to do it. Quite often, what you want to use is a pesticide that actually coats them, and they suffocate. Okay, and so that's a, a pesticide that you use, but it's uh, it's uh, it. You have to make sure that you cover every spider mite, okay? Because it, it's a physical way to control them instead of a chemical way to control them through uh, their food source. Okay, leaf galls. And we have all kinds of different kinds of leaf galls. Uh, quite often what you'll see is something like, uh, like this. And if you open up that bump, you'll see uh, immature insects in there. And what they've done is they, the eggs have been laid, they start to, to grow, and then they form uh, this structure, if you will, around themselves. So they've got a nice dry roof over their head. Okay? These are difficult to control because 
and most people don't see this until they see the bumps. And when they see the bumps, then that there that insect is uh, that is uh, is uh, uh, protected by the uh, structure. And so, uh, just making an application at that time won't do you any good. So it's something that you have to do a little earlier. Okay. You'll have to make a pesticide application as the young have hatched and they're starting to make that leaf gall. Okay. Generally, the leaf gall is not everything that we've talked about except for okay. bagworms can kill an evergreen and they can wipe it out. But if they work on a, um, a maple tree, it's usually not detrimental. Uh, spider mites, if you get the population high enough, they can suck all of the juices out of the plant and it will meet its demise. With leaf galls, generally that's not a problem, it's just and look good. Okay? And it, obviously it's going to slow down the vigor of a plant because if you and I have a cold for six months or a year or a year and a half, uh, you're going to lose some vigor. Uh, and plants will do the same thing, but it really is not something that will cause it to, to die, okay? Colorado potato beetle. It's called Colorado potato beetle, if I remember correctly, because it was first identified in Colorado. Oh, she doesn't even know. Oh, I found something she might not know. Okay. But anyway, it is a major problem on, on uh, potatoes because uh, it's very difficult to kill them, okay? They just seem to not want to die for some reason. So you have to get an insecticide that will, um, an insecticide that probably will to a certain extent be ingested and also uh, something that will affect them uh, through their body, okay? They are very difficult to control. Uh, a lot of the common pesticides that most gardeners use, will, like seven, will not work on. Okay. Um, and what's really interesting about this is uh, we have a lot of potato growers in our area. I mean, commercial potato growers. One of the largest potato producers in our area is down in the boot hills. A company called Black Gold. And I happened to be reading a magazine one time, and they have 40,000 40, acres of potatoes that grow in America. That's a bunch. But I also understand that they supply all the potatoes for Frito, uh, what's the major potato? Frito, Frito Light, uh, for the 4th of July potato chip crop. Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I thought that was. Anyway. Colorado potato beetles are very hard to control. Uh, they can do a lot of damage if you are a major potato grower or even if you're really into potatoes in your vegetable garden. You can see that they've eaten most of the foliage. And so uh, obviously a plant needs leaves to produce the sugars and everything it needs to produce so that those potatoes can get big and grow. So that's a really kind of a problem we have in our area. These are aphids, okay, and they're soft-bodied insects. They're kind of like spider mites in a way. Spider mites are soft-bodied, aphids are soft-bodied. Um, so you have to, you can spray something that coats them or something that they can pick up through their body, uh, an insecticide. Uh, you can, um, they have a mouth part like a, uh, again, a hypodermic needle. So if you put something on like seven on them, it won't do any good. Okay. And the reason why I keep talking about seven is it just seems like I, I see lots of gardeners. And, uh, you know, they'll come in and say, well, I got this problem and I didn't know what to do, so I put seven. <laughs> okay? I mean, this is a comment I hear day in and day out. Well, you don't want to do that, okay? And the reason why you don't want to do that is seven kills, in some cases, 
predator insects. So not only do you want to kill the bug, but you want to make sure that the pesticides that you use don't kill beneficial bugs. Because in some cases, you can kill the predator insect with seven, and you're actually making your problem worse because there's no other insects out there munching on the one that's munching on your plant. Okay. So only use seven whenever you think that you've got an insect that is actually munching. Okay. And seven has been around for years and years and years and years. Okay. It's a really pretty good insecticide. It requires ingestion. Uh, at one time, and don't quote me on this, I was told that the LD50 on carbaryl, on seven or carbaryl, is less than a lot of common stuff that we eat. Okay? Which is really kind of interesting. It's just not a major uh, pesticide problem to affect us as humans. And that's one of the reasons why it's, it's been used so much and been around so long. Okay? But just use it whenever you, it's going to work. But aphids, uh, you can see they have different colors, uh, greens, reds. Uh, they work on a lot of different insects, uh, a, lot of li a lot of different plants, okay? And you can generally see them with the naked eye, okay? They're not super fast, but uh, they will move a little bit for you, okay? Okay, this is magnolia scale, okay? If you have a magnolia tree, if you have a tulip poplar, okay, you might have a different, there are different scales, so they all have a little bit different appearance, okay? But what there is is a insect underneath that scale, that they formed a, a roof over themselves, okay? And they are just sucking juices out of the plant, okay? And uh, you can see in some cases a uh, change in the foliage. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a major problem with people coming into Sunny Hill and saying, I'm getting this black stuff all over my car. It's sitting in the garage and it's turning black. Well, I would ask him, do you have a tulip poplar tree? Well, yeah. And is that where you parked your car? Yes. I said that black stuff is the scale, the juices coming out of the scale, dripping down on your car, and it's, it's uh, kind of sweet, if you will, and then algae is growing in that, turning it black. Kind of interesting, isn't it? But anyway, uh, this is a hard one to control because if you have a large tree, it's hard to get a pesticide up there. Uh, so a lot of people use what's called the systemic insecticide. They'll mix it up, pour it around the ground, and it moves up into the plant and will kill the scale that way. What's really interesting um, is uh, the state of Missouri Forestry Department was giving out a lot of trees for people to plant. Okay? And what we found was that if you planted pure stands of tulip poplar, which is a, gets about 100 feet tall, that they get this scale, in, if they get a scale infestation in that particular plantation, it just goes through all of the trees because there's no other foliage in between the two plants that are susceptible to this particular insect. If you go out into the woods and you will find tulip poplar, it's a plant here and a plant there and a plant there. Okay. But we, uh, as humans, want to uh, plant monocultures, and uh, so that's what happens. Okay. So if you want a tulip poplar, just don't plant any around the other tulip poplar trees. Okay. The tulip proper scale uh, was, was a really a major problem a couple of years ago. And why I say it was a major problem a couple of year, years ago is we had just had a lot of people coming in and asking that. Did okay. it kill the tree? Huh? Does it kill the tree? No. It will kill it eventually, but it'll take a long time. 
again, it will be like you and I having a cold for a couple of years. Okay, it's not something that is going to eat up the leaves and knock it out overnight. Okay. This is cucumber, cucumber vine borer, okay? I don't know whether you've ever grown cucumbers, but you have long vines. And what will happen is people will come into Sunny Hill and they say, I have this beautiful cucumber vine yesterday and I went out today and it's all dead. Okay? Well, what happens is this cucumber, this is the adult, and he lays eggs right at the ground line on the cucumber vine. The eggs hatch and then they pupate or a move, a change into a worm and then the worm goes right into the plant and starts to bore out the vine, okay? And that's the reason why it's called a vine bore. These are very hard to control because once the cucumber the, the uh, larvae gets into the cucumber vine, it's almost impossible to get a pesticide to it. Now, I've had several people say that when they were kids, their mother would give them a knitting needle, and they'd run that up through the center of the cucumber vine. That would be one way to kill the, the boar. Okay? A lot of different ways to control insects. <laughs> but, what you have to do is to apply a pesticide along the vine right at the, right at the soil surface uh, so that whenever the adults come to lay their eggs and the egg starts to hatch, it's killed at that particular time. Yes? Two questions. Um, one is the squash line board, does it attack things other than cucumbers like squash and... Yes. And, um, Mm -hmm. and all those mm -hmm. things. Sure. Okay. Okay. sure and then so sprinkling like seven dust around before you see the signs right at the base of the plant with that seven a lot of times we'll go to a, a, a different pesticide besides seven because we want more activity than just ingestion. Okay? okay. So seven is we'll take a, like a bifenthrin or something like that and we'll use that instead. So well, seven steps would help, but it's not yes. very effective. Right. Okay. Right. Should you like just do it as a common Most people measure? do it as a, as a precaution, yes. Like when you plant it or after it rains well, or what? Well, once it gets up to some size, you know, like a couple feet long or something, then they'll apply that right around the line. And it'll be something you don't have to redo, you know, every couple of weeks or so, depending on how much uh, rain you get. Okay. Okay, this is the famous Japanese beetle. Okay. The Japanese beetle was introduced from in the United States in 1916 uh, by a, a shipload of plants that came to New York. And they liked the Americas so well, they started expanding their population. And we've had a wave going westward from New York since then. Okay. It hit our area about eight or nine years ago. One of the gals who works for me lives in uh, Perryville. And she went out one day to look at a birch tree. And it was just swarming with Japanese beetles. She didn't know what they were. We got identified. And so that was the first time that we had seen them on this side of the Mississippi. It was a major problem in Tennessee. In fact, there are quarantines, and you have to treat plants in a very specific way to move them out of Tennessee into other states. Okay? The Japanese beetle, if you look at it, this is the identifying characteristics. It's about uh, oh, half an inch long. Got a kind of a greenish, shiny head. But look at all of the white tufts around its backside. Okay. Um, the adult is a muncher, okay, and the adult is attracted to other bugs, other uh, Japanese beetles by a, a 
what do they call that? It's a scent, but it's a pheromone. A pheromone, okay? Um, to tell you how quickly they can pick that up, I, a couple years ago, was at Sunny Hill and I was taking a Japanese beetle trap out and I was putting the scent on the, uh, the trap as I walked out the back door and I was swarmed by Japanese beetles within 25 seconds. Okay. The problem with Japanese beetles, there are several problems with them. Okay. Well, first of all, let me hear what their life cycle is. As adults, usually around the first middle of June, uh, they uh, come out of the ground as adults. And uh, they have two things on their mind. Feeding and sex, okay, and they're going to produce young and they're going to feed because they're going to only last six to eight weeks. Uh, the female will lay up to 20 or 30 eggs per day in the soil, okay, and uh, these eggs then uh, you, uh, they, they change metamorphose into uh, grubs, okay. And these are the grubs here, okay? Now, the adult is a problem because they're eating up foliage, just decimating it, okay? Uh, the grub itself can be a problem. A lot of people don't think about that, but the grub is a little bitty sod cutter. And he'll go out there or she'll go out there and they'll just start eating roots, okay? I have seen a four acre lawn wiped out in a weekend by grubs. I mean, you go out there and you just pull it back like sod. Mm -hmm. So they can be a very major problem. They, the, the grubs stay in the soil till next spring and the whole process gets started again. Now, they are munchers, so you can control the adults by seven or any of the standard pesticides that a lot of people spray on their trees and shrubs for protection. Okay. They're really not that hard to control. The other thing that you can do is trap them, okay? And you have a trap with the pheromone on the trap and they are attracted to that. They somehow or another move down into the container and they're not smart enough to climb back out, so they die. I've had in, uh, people tell me they had seven or ten of these traps in their landscape and they were emptying them two and three times a day. Okay. Now, uh, Dr. Svensson, uh, who uh, is uh, the horticulturist at Seymour, was in Ohio about the time of the wave of Japanese beetles hit Ohio. And he said it was a major problem. Pardon me. It was a major problem uh, because the population was so high. But once the population, the first wave hit, then the population kind of dropped down and it's been somewhat steady ever since. Okay. If you use traps, you need to make sure that those traps are away from <coughs> your plant material and realize that you have to have enough traps to not only pull them away from your plant material, but if you're an area that has a lot of Japanese beetles in it, your neighbors, for example, you've got to have enough traps to get all of theirs, too, okay? So probably the easiest way to control them is to spray something like seven or one of your basic pesticides, but it's something that's going to have to be done more than once, okay? Again, if you have any questions at any time, let me know. These are lace bugs on azaleas. And if you look at the wings, they're very lacy. Okay? okay. And a bug is an insect with a mouth part like a hypodermic needle. And again, will suck the juices out of a plant. What you will see on the bottom of your azalea leaves looks like little black bug poop. 
what it looks like. Okay, and you'll see a lot of that. The leaf will have a funny looking color. A lot, quite often, it'll have a gray tinge to it. Okay, and the way you have to control for the uh, azalea lace bug is to spray it with a insecticide that is a topical control. Okay, and. Uh, you can also use the systemic, which moves up into the plant and uh, kills them as they suck juices out of the plant. This can be a major problem. I normally don't see azaleas dying from it unless it's a lace bug infestation year after year after year after year. But they certainly will make your azaleas look pretty bad. Okay? Okay, grubs. I mentioned before I saw a four acre lawn wiped out on a weekend. Okay. Um, I saw the University of Missouri football field about a week or two before one of the big games. Just, it looked like something had gone in there with a hole and just torn it all up. What it was was skunks had come in and looked for grubs, and they were just tearing up the football field. It was not a very pleasant odor either. <laughs> but anyway, grubs are a part of the life cycle of beetles, okay? You got the May beetle, the June beetle, the mass chafer, Japanese beetle, chafers, all kinds of different insects. What you have to understand is some of these grubs live in the soil one year, a few two years, and a lot of them three years. The grub, the female lays her egg in the soil, it changes into a, a grub, and the grub is a plant eater, so it will eat roots, okay? And it can be a major problem, okay? Um, like, the May June beetle, I believe that's the one that has a three year grub, isn't it? I think so. The grub stays in the soil for three years. And they get quite sizable, size of my little finger a little bit larger. Again, they can do major damage. If you find a grub here and a grub there and a grub there, well, that's not a problem. But I've seen 10 to 12 grubs per square foot mm -hmm. in lawns and in garden areas. And when you have that many grubs, you've got a problem. Now, grubs themselves move up and down in the soil based upon soil moisture and soil temperature. Probably the optimum time for control of the grub itself in the soil is in April and August. That's the time they are the closest to the soil surface. They're close in April because they're getting ready to change into adults and come out and start the next generation. Um, you do them in August because it's usually drier, uh, it's still warm, and they move up close to the soil surface in, uh, in August. Okay. The way to control the grub is generally using a granular pesticide which moves down into the soil and attacks on that away. Okay. I like a granular insecticide because if you use a sprayable insecticide, a lot of those are sensitive to uh, light, sunlight. Sunlight will break down. If it sits on a leaf of a, a grass blade, it can be uh, destroyed by sunlight. It's activity, okay? So I like the uh, granular material that goes down into the, into the lawn area. It's shaded, uh, and it gets watered in or rained in, and it moves down into the soil. Um, you have to get the insecticide to move down into the soil. If you have a lot of organic matter, that will hold the insecticide. So uh, that's one of the issues. You want to make sure that you use a granular insecticide at the time when those insects are closest to the soil surface because that insecticide doesn't have to move through the environment very far. Did you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, do you recommend treating for lawn grubs twice a year in April and August, or just one of the If I were going to do one time, I would do it in August. Okay. Uh, but what happens is a lot of people come in in the spring and talk about it. Um, and so I said, 
the first year, maybe do it in April, and then and do it in August, and then go to a one year in August application. Okay? Like I said, the adults are laying their eggs. So you'll have the highest in the summer. So you'll have the highest concentration of grubs uh, in the August, September time period. And so you get the biggest bang for your insecticide bucket at that time. Okay? Uh, Oh, these are, okay, yeah, this continues on the next page. You can see what they look like in the soil, and you just take the sod and pull it back, okay, um, and you can start to see damage. It looks like a change in color. Well, you need to get down in the prayer position and look for both funguses and check for grubs in that particular situation, okay? I had uh, one uh, individual call me and said that their lawn was uh, turned around, and I said, uh, check for, uh, you know, a fungus. And they couldn't find anything, so I said, well, check for grubs, and they started just, they had like a 10,000 acre, 10,000 square foot lawn, and it was just practically gone. What's really interesting, though, is if you catch it soon enough and you pour the water to it, Think of it this way, when you lay new sod, it has no root system. So you lay the sod, you pour the water on it, and the roots grow down. Well, grubs are little bitty sod cutters, so you have a, a piece of sod, if you will. So if you pour the water to it, a lot of times it'll come back. Okay. Army worms. I mean, one for punishment, we had an infestation of these this spring, especially on wheat fields. And when you say army worms, that's exactly what's moving through a wheat field is an army of worms. Okay? Now, I have seen it in several lawns over the last 10 to 15 years in Cape Girardeau, where they will move across a lawn and just eat it up. But generally what's interesting is they don't get down to the crown of the grass. So it's not lethal, but it certainly makes your front lawn look pretty bad. And all they do is just munch the foliage. And you can see the uh, broad band there, and the, it's, the, it's the larvae that does the damage. Okay. Here's a picture of the adult. Uh, and then you just need to use a pesticide where you spray an insecticide over your entire lawn uh, and it will control them pretty easily. But they move very quickly, okay? Like several feet per hour. Uh, that one is the true army worm, which is where the worm was here sooner, earlier, okay? I actually have several slides. Remember, I showed you the several slides on them, so it's up to you however you want to talk about it. Okay. And this is a different army worm there. Okay. When we, a lot of times we'll talk about an insect and we'll call it like an army worm, but there's more than one species involved. Is that why it got that name? Well, yes, but um, so some of them, like the true army worm and the uh, yellow striped, I believe, is early, and the beet, and then the next one is the fall army worm, which is later on in the year. And they're kind of a generalist feeder. Um, there's different ways of IDing these guys. It's very difficult. Um, the larvae actually has a Y on its head, which you probably saw in that first slide, which I can tell it's an army worm. But to get more specific on, you know, whether it's a yellow stripe, it is a true army worm, it's a beet army worm, there's just a lot of different features. So some will have spots, some will 
people have spots on their second abdominal site. Maybe it's just, I mean, basically just know it's an army worn by the Y on their, on their, on their head. Um, but they're a generalist feeder, so, you know, some of them are more apple or apple certain vegetables. Some will go more toward your farm or do more certain crops. Um, so it, it depends on the time of year and what is, is actually out there in the eating and what you're actually planting. So I guess the, the take home message is just you know, know that there's several species of army worms. Just look at its head, find the eye on its head, and know it's an army worm. And just, just, just you know that there's several species out there. And that's, that's what we're talking about. In many cases, we're talking about a group of insects that have several species. Just makes it gives her something else to think about. Mm -hmm. well, I love sitting in ID and stuff. So <laughs> that's one, one of my favorite things is to on things. Okay. This is the rose sawfly. This is a is and <coughs> was a major insect infestation in the heartland this spring. Mm -hmm. If you had knockout roses, and that's what most people have, and you brought in a leaf that had a bunch of holes munched in it, if you flipped it over and looked very, very closely, you would see a very short, dark green, in this case, worm. And uh, it was very hard to see because it was camouflaged almost like the color of the foliage of the rose. And they are munchers, and they were eating holes in the leaves. They're a little harder to control than a lot of things because generally you would only find the worm on the lower surface of the leaf. So if you sprayed it, and you sprayed from the top, a lot of times that insecticide wouldn't get close to it. Now once they moved and, and chewed through the leaf, and picked up some of the pesticide on top, that would they'd meet their demise. But if you remember the spring, we had a lot of rain. Mm -hmm. It almost would have had to go out there every other day and spray the pesticide to get rid of them. The question is, will my rose survive? Well, generally, yes. A lot of that damaged foliage is going to fall off, but roses are pretty uh, hardy. And so they'll start to put out new shoots and new leaves, and eventually they'll start to bloom again. Okay. In many cases, you might have a shoot here, there, there, or yon, and just didn't make any trim those out. Okay. So is this above the cycled out now, or is it still going to be on my plants? What I've found is, and you may not correct me here, is that a lot of the insect populations are based upon environmental conditions. If the environmental conditions are just exactly right, that population will explode. If the environmental conditions are not quite right, uh, it may get larger. If the environmental conditions are not conducive at all, it will keep that population limited. What are the conditions for growth so far? I'm not really sure. All I know is that we had a bunch this year. It's like army worms. It depends on, um, like some years you'll have, a, like like what was it last year? The year before, my neighbor says in the fall, he says, my Bermuda grass is getting eaten up by army worm, or you know, like farmers are having problems with with army worm in their in their wheat fields. Army worms are actually what's considered a secondary pest. They're not a key pest. In, in most cases, correct me if I'm wrong. In most cases. Um, they're actually held back by predators. So, like Paul said, if there's some sort of environmental condition that affected the predators, then the army worms are going to basically overpopulate and cause damage. It, it's the same way with the sawfly. All these insects have some sort of predator, whether it be, I know it's six-legged, an eight-legged, or a fungus that's going to attack them. It depends on this triangle, which if you, you know, take plant pathology, you know, all of these factors come into play as far as how, you know, that insect or pathogen um, actually grows. So it, it, it yeah, it, it just varies. I mean, we will probably more likely, correct me if I'm wrong, have a big Japanese beetle outbreak because the soil's been so wet.
they're going to e they're going to be able to dig out very easily. Now, if it's dry, they usually have a hard time digging out of that soil. The other thing is, if the soil is wet when the llamas are flying around, it's a lot easier for them to uh, drill a hole in the uh, in the soil and lay a few eggs. She was talking about the pathology triangle. You've got to have three things for a disease or an insect problem. You have to have a host. You have to have, which is the plant that is being attacked. You have to have the right environmental conditions. And you've got to have the, in this case, the insect organism which causes the problem, or in the case of pathology, the fungus or the bacteria that causes the problem. So when you get all three of those exactly right, the population will boom. But if one of those three legs of the triangle is not right, you may have a population that it won't explode. Okay. okay so what I need to know is, you know, I, I cut my roses back, yep. and now new shoots are coming out. I guess I should spray. It's not like these these worms matured and became an adult and flew away. They're still there, right? You may, I don't know what the life cycle of that salt fly is. I don't remember the salt fly, but I can look it up. I usually would think that it's not a. They're not laying eggs and producing a new generation or something. <laughs> salt flies are interesting. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but they're saying a lot of insects called pine saw fly. Okay? And the female has a, I don't know what the term is, but on her backside where she lays her eggs, it looks like a saw. And she cuts the bark of the twig and then lays her eggs in the crack between the bark and uh, the, the, the wood. And it's the same thing here. And the yeah. Okay. So I should spray or no? I would. Okay. Yeah. But you can actually inspect and look at leaves. If you start to see a little damage, look at the leaves, flip them over, and you can see the larvae. Uh, it's, you're going to have to look for it, but you can see it. Well, I'm not encourage. I don't want to encourage you just to spray a pesticide because you think there might be a problem. I would encourage you to identify what the problem is and then select the pesticide or the method of control based upon identification. I have so many people come in and say, like I said, well, I couldn't figure out what it was, so I sprayed seven. Okay, uh, that's not the way to go about it. Uh, as again, sometimes you can make a problem. And yeah, the sawfly, is, at least the pine sawfly, has just one generation a year. Okay, that's what I figured. Yeah. Okay, box elder bugs. This is a major problem this year. It's usually a major problem in the fall. Oh, yeah. And the reason why it's a problem is it doesn't affect plant foliage very much. Uh, if it killed all the box elders, I don't know that anybody would be too upset about that anyway. <laughs> but you find it around box elders. The major problem is they congregate around your windows and your doors, and sometimes they become inhabitants of your home, and that's the problem <coughs> with box elder bugs. Now, I've seen more box elder bugs later in the spring this year than I have Again, it's not generally a plant problem, it's just a housekeeping problem. Okay. I have talked uh, too long. <laughs> it's five minutes to eight. Do you have any questions so far? Yes. Um, we have squash plants in the vegetable garden, and we thought it was because of all the rain and just growing like crazy. Uh, but several of the stems have kind of Bent. We thought maybe the high winds may have bent them or the underground weight, but it was stuck. Mm -hmm. um, and could we have that boar beetle or whatever? Um, you could possibly. Usually, what will happen though is it, it'll just you, one day you plant it up fine, and the next day it'll be gone. Okay. It'll We're also seeing a lot of disease on a lot of the curcumins this year. 
because of the amount of moisture. Uh, when you add moisture, high humidity, when you get uh, cool temperatures for some diseases, but warm temperatures for others, they just go Okay? So, and that's what we're seeing a lot of right now. I brought along some pesticides. Um, here is liquid carburel, otherwise known as 7. Again, this is a good pesticide for bugs that much. Okay? This one is malathion, and you've probably heard of that. That's been on the market for a long time. Be careful, malathion will burn some plants. Okay? So I have a tendency to stay away from it. Okay. Um, this is boar bagworm spray. It is by a broad spectrum, it's going to be the bifentrin. It is a material that uh, will move into the <coughs> insect body, okay, through spir spiracles and, place and different parts of the body. So they don't necessarily have to ingest this, they can actually die because it, it was sprayed on their body. Okay. Um, this is a systemic insect spray, and it also comes in a granule material. And by systemic, it moves into the plant, okay? And so it works pretty good on insects that suck juices out of it. It does not have a edible plant label, okay? So what you have to do when you choose your plant, uh, your pesticides, is also look at the label and see and I use it on a tomato plant, okay? The other thing that you need to check on is how long from the time that I make the application to the time I can eat it, okay? Some pesticides, you can eat it the same day. In some products, uh, I've seen it in some of the grape uh, pesticides, you have to wait for 40, 50 days after you make an application, and, that, and that's a fungicide, okay? So you gotta be careful there. Um, again, this is also in the form of granule and works, works pretty well. This is boar bagworm spray. It's a spinosad product, which is a natural product. Um, and uh, it works on worms. It doesn't work on other parts of the, uh, work, doesn't work on other insects, okay? It doesn't work on the adults, but it works on the, that stage of the life cycle. Now uh, this is a permethrin product and it quite often can be used on pets, it can be used on vegetables, okay? It has labels for that. So it's a, the only problem is sometimes when you get a, a particular insect that's very hard to control to work with, the permethrin won't work super well. This is neem oil, this is a natural product. It works somewhat as an insecticide and also as a fungicide. Um, and a lot of people like to use these, use that. Some insects that are hard to control, it won't work on, okay? It's kind of interesting. People will come in, into uh, Sunny Hill and say, I want a natural product to get rid of the insects and disease and all that stuff. And we'll show you these products. And, in a week, and if it doesn't work, a week or two, they'll come back in and say, it didn't work, and I want to kill it. What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> kind of a cute, you know, but that does happen. Um, this is an insecticidal soap. The, the oils and the insecticidal soap will work on soft-bodied insects, like aphids and maybe some of the mites and it'll just actually kill them because it coats the skin and that, they just, it, it, it eliminates their skin problem. This is dipel dust, this is called bacillus, which is a uh, bacteria, right? Okay, and back, it's a bacteria, and this will work on worms also, okay? Uh, a lot of times they'll use this for bagworms and things like that. It's a dust? You can get it as a dust or as a spray. How do you spray. put that out? How do you apply that? You just, you just sprinkle it. Shake it off. Huh. Okay. Now, some of the. Uh, go ahead. Is that also referred as BT? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's also referred to as BT. Mm -hmm. 
Bacillus thuringiensis. Okay. Uh, these particular products here are fertilizers, but they have a, this systemic insecticide in a granular form with them. And I've been recommending this for azaleas, for the lace bugs. You need to fertilize azaleas in the spring, and my suggestion is use, if you've had lace bug problems in the past, use it with the systemic insecticide. The other thing is, if you've had problems with the roses, my recommendation would be to use that fertilizer to help that plant, you know, come back from the infestation. Again, it has a systemic insecticide in it, so you get some double duty out of it. Okay? With the, you have some um, of the pesticides, insecticides that are powder and some that are liquid. What's best? It depends on the insect, the life cycle, the stage that you're trying to control. It depends on whether you want to uh, dust or whether you want to spray. So a lot of it has to do with the, the applicator. You know how he or she would prefer to apply the pesticide. Okay. And in some cases, uh, you can say, well, a powder will work better, or in some cases, a, a spray will work better. But generally, it really depends on the uh, applicator. Anything else? No, I just had some insects over there that we talked about. If you want to look at them up close. Sure. Yes. Are, are almost all of these, or are, are, are all of them harmful to bees? We, we keep bees. Most of them are. are. All of them are? Not all of them, I would what, say. What would be safe for bees, or safer for bees? Uh, probably a, a, a dust. Like seven's dust, is it? That's not good for bees. I would no, be it's that. not good for bees. The other thing is you've got to time your application. For example, we make a, we have a spray schedule for fruit trees in Sunny Hill. But one of the things that we do is do not make an application when they're in bloom. Okay. So if you can keep your applications away from bloom time, that will help. Okay. I wanted to mention too about Japanese beetles. The easiest way for me, since I'm retired, but I take five minutes, like every day, go out with a little bucket filled with about an inch of water, That's right. and, uh, put the, the soap in it, and then just put it underneath, and you just hit the limb, and they just fall right in, and it's pleasant death. <laughs> <laughs> And you grin every time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Pleasant for you. <laughs> well, that's actually, uh, bagworm control, a lot of people do that. I mean, they just pick bagworms off. Uh, and potato bugs, I've, I've had uh, some grandparents say that they pay their kids a penny or their grandkids a penny or two pennies or a, a nickel a bug that they can find on the potato plant and, and squash. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, Roxanne brought along some insects and uh, where you can actually see the actual insect. She brought her, her collection along. And if you want to look at that, she'll be glad to help you point out what we were kind of looking. I just picked out what some of the past problems were that we really ran into this year and, you know, several years ago. How often, how often do you need to water your garden? Yeah, I need to. Now, that sounds like a stupid answer. Um, but you just, you, you need to dig into the soil, and when you don't see much moisture in there, water it. If you could water from the, below the surface, if you could water where you didn't go this way, with a, it would be better. You'll want to water in the morning instead of the evening. Uh, but if you're going to err on the side of being too wet or too dry, you always want to err on the side of being too dry. Okay. Okay? Um, 
And the, uh, the, the, there's several things involved here. You know, you heard the phrase, no pain, no gain. You want to create a little pain so that those plants put their roots deeper. Yeah. If, you do, if you continually put the moisture on it, they're just going to sit up on top and take their welfare check. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the other thing is um, you want to water in the morning because diseases, funguses, need a period of time to incubate to get started, and it has to be dark. So, and most of the time they grow and germinate in what's called free water, just water droplets on a leaf, okay? Mm -hmm. So, think about it. If you go out there at 8 o'clock at night and water your garden overhead, and then your garden is going to, the plants are going to be in the dark for 8 or 10 hours, mm -hmm. you're going to have this free moisture on the leaf, and if we've got some warm evenings, that is the perfect conditions for those diseases to get started. So if you water in the morning, uh, that will dry off all of the moisture on the foliage, um, and uh, you have not created a lot of extra conditions for the diseases to get going. How far down would you dig to look for moisture? Like, not that far. Sure. So if you see moisture that farther down, mm -hmm. then it's about time to yeah, you know, four inches, six inches, you know. Okay. Yeah. I see more people killing more plants with a water hose than anything else. Too much water. Too much water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else? What about a tomato, the, the, that rot on the bottom of them? What? The bottom of the tomato the itself. Tomato, tomato rot, what do you call it? That's a calcium deficiency. Okay. So there's two things you can do. You can lime your garden. Mm -hmm. okay. Or if the pH in your garden is correct, you put gypsum on it because that's calcium sulfate. Okay. Gypsum won't change the pH of the soil. Okay. But it will give you calcium. Calcium moves slow in a plant from the roots up, okay? And of course, the tomato's growing very rapidly. The other thing, you, you know, that's, that's your long-term control is <clears throat> lime or calcium sulfate to your body. The short-term control is get a bottle of liquid calcium and go after every day or every other day as that green tomato forms and spray it with liquid calcium. Mm -hmm. And generally, that will help eliminate that, what's called blossom end rot. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is the same thing true of like zucchinis or squash if they're rotten at yes. the end? Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Well, these may already have like, well, you, you were saying they have. Some of them have blight already. Like the bottom leaves are, you know, kind of getting... Get rid of them. Get, no, get rid of the plant, get rid of the bottom leaves. You can't, once it gets on there, it's, you, you can't stop it. You can slow it down, so use a, a fungicide with a vegetable label. You can slow it down. The other thing, if I were you, I'd start some new plants because Certain people that I've talked to say that the blight problem is so bad in their garden, so what they'll do is they'll plant two or three tomato crops throughout the season. Hmm. Okay. And rotating crops probably helps a lot with that too. It will help, yes. That's what they say is you don't plant your tomatoes in the same spot all the time. Could go ahead and pull off the leaves. Yes, I would. The other thing is that when you plant your leaves, you plant your uh, tomatoes, you may want to start a fungicide application right then. The other thing is, if you can uh, eliminate some of the splashing from rain so that the soil doesn't splash up on the leaves, that will slow it down too. So how do you do that? Make sure that all of the leaves at the bottom are, are cut off and then put some sort of a mulch or okay. newspaper or something around the bottom of your tomatoes. Do you, 
cut suckers off of like you know your tomatoes when they're starting out? But those well, little, they you know, have uh, you know you'll have a major leaf coming out and then a, a smaller leaf and in the uh, axle of the bigger leaf and of the stem. That's mm -hmm. what you want to pop off. So you you do yeah. And what you want to do is it's a plant that is a fruit producer, and a tomato actually is a fruit. Mm -hmm. It's not a vegetable, it's a fruit. But a fruit producer, that plant has so much energy. Now I can use that energy to put roots, fl uh, flowers, and fruit, or more leaves. Okay? So you want to give it a balance, and you want to give it enough leaves to produce great big fruit. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that determine that like with tomatoes, whether you pull a sucker, does that depend on whether it's determinate or indeterminate? Right. Okay. A determinate tomato will produce one major tomato crop and then quit. And your tomato growers, that's what they want, because they can come in there once, harvest, and get rid of them. The indeterminates, they can't figure out when to uh, produce their tomatoes, so they pr produce them all summer long. Like Early Girl is a variety that produces, uh, it's a determinate tomato, and it's a very short date. So a lot of people will plant one Early Girl so they can have their tomato before the 4th of July <laughs> and win the contest that year, and then the rest of them will be indeterminate tomatoes. So some of uh, the tomatoes are short and stocky. Are those probably maybe the celebrities? Well, there are what are called bush tomatoes. Okay. You might find a better bush, for example. It's a better boy, but it's a bush variety. And the stalk is thicker, and it's a shorter plant. Yeah. And these particular plants were designed by breeders for people who grow in containers. Because, you know, tomatoes are actually vines, you know, and a lot of people think I'm crazy, but a tomato is a vine. Mm -hmm. And uh, its kissing cousin is a potato and peppers. Okay. And so uh, what you have to realize is, you know, you get a plant that's six or eight feet tall, it's going to have a problem standing up in a two-gallon pot. <laughs> That's the reason why they go to the bush variety. Anything else?